I am going to call the meeting to order. We are a couple minutes late. Quite a few, few of us were in the cafeteria uh, listening to the conversation there. And it was exciting to see so many folks come out to take part in that conversation. So um, the first item on the agenda is comments from the public on items not on the agenda. Did anyone come to speak about anything that isn't going to be discussed tonight? <laughs> why don't you tell me why you came to speak to it? Um, we are going to have an update on how that went and so forth. So. Um, how this works for folks who are new to coming to meetings is when we get to that agenda item, um, we'll give the board a chance to come in and ask questions first, and then we open it up to the audience for comments or questions. So um, when we're at that item, make sure you raise your hand. Okay, great. Any other, anything else? All right, I see lots of principals here, welcome. Um, so let's move to the consent agenda. Does anybody need to pull anything from the consent agenda? I will move that we approve the consent agenda, including the school board meeting minutes of March 8th, 2018, and the part-time leave of absence, unpaid part-time leave of absence for Ashley Bry, the EHS Spanish teacher, and approval of warrants. Second. Okay, consent agendas don't have discussion, so all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna move on to our presentation for this evening which is a discussion of the structured collaborative time that's being considered for next year. So I'll turn it over to our superintendent, Beth Cobb. I don't have Brian here as my clicker. Uh -huh. So, oh, else? you I could. Can. I think what I want to do is stand on the corner so that I can speak to the audience and get participation and to you also. Is that? Okay. And I Am I loud enough? Beth, Actually. <laughs> you are very loud, just oh, like no. I am. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, I will use this though. Oh no, I'll leave it there. Okay, so the purpose of tonight's meeting is to share with you um, why we would like collaborative time and the purpose behind that and the whys um, and a little of the how. And as you know, as superintendent, I am always focusing on like, why are we doing it? How will we do it? And then, um, so the, the why is a big, huge piece for me. Can you see if I'm standing here? Okay, so we do have principals here and other admin to, you can chime in when you want to, and I might look at you for help or um, collaborative discussion. So we did put out a survey to, before we even get to this, we put out to this, a survey to the admin team asking about if they were to prioritize start, stop time, collaborative time, um, and we kind of put all that thinking about the changes that we would like to see, and we put that out to them as a survey, and collaborative time came out tops. So if we do anything, can we have the collaborative time? Because they all know as administrators that that was important. Okay, cool. <laughs> so for the promise of the merger, um, we have the continuum of educational experience for a pre-K-12 system. That was from the promise of the merger through the, um, for the Center of Technology in Essex also as one system. And then also looking at the, um, the ability in one system now to track cohorts through starting in pre-K or K and going through um, the 12th grade. So 
that's a promise of the merger and by some collaborative time we'll be able to do this and use the cohort data to, to help us improve. <laughs> so this promise that you've been promised will take time and really effective communication to move forward in a positive um, way. Hmm. Hmm. Right. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So these are some characteristics that um, of successful schools. These, this research has been done across the United States, internationally. Um, and so some of the things that pop out for us when we think about the collaborative time and that we've had discussions as leadership team is having that clear vision and a true dedication to the vision. So now we have a draft vision. The leadership team has been working on a theory of action, which is like a step to that vision. Um, and then how are we going to get there? So that's work that the leadership team has been talking about and working on really since the summertime on shared values and things. The, another one that pops out is collaboratively, effectively working together in teams and across teams. And that's what the learning communities are about. So we would like to see teams collaborative in schools and then across the district too, at least once a month to be able to get all third grade teachers together, all math teachers together. If you're looking at um, middle school and high school, we would like to see, and this has us thinking about um, when that collaborative time happens, we'd like to see and have the ability so middle school teachers and high school teachers could work together some too on a vertical alignment. And then the shared leadership was one of them, that's okay, it's okay. <laughs> The shared leadership is the other one. So when you have shared leadership, it is another way to improve schools. By having collaborative teams, it would take teacher leaders, and that is the shared leadership. So it's not left to a principal bu um, a building principal by themselves to improve their own school, but as a district, we have the shared leadership across, including with teacher leadership. Anybody want to add anything so far? That's the vision. You don't want that, yeah. I'm sorry. That's I okay. I can click. You want me? You want, I can take the mouse over here. Well, I could, I think what happened was the the um, cursor moved, and then oh. when I clicked, it went to something else. You know, what, even the keyboard might be. Okay. Helpful. Oh, that would be yeah. better, right? Uh, now <laughs> I have a calculator. <laughs> I do like that. Come on. Do you want to do mouse right now? That one's better. <laughs> <laughs> so to have success for all, this is also what research says that when professional learning occurs within a system driven by high expectation, shared goals, professionalism, and peer accountability, which happens in collaborative teams, it is known that you are more accountable when you are accountable to your peers than someone even superior to you. Or, um, and that happens also with students. And the outcome is really about the deep change for students and all students. So if we have this commitment to professionalism and the time, and when I think about collaborative time, I think about it being real intentional, very clear goals that lead to our vision, to our action theory, um, is when the deep change for a system can really happen. And it's really about kids. So even though the teachers are having the collaborative time, but the change happens within the system and better for our students. Comments to that, anybody from the admin team? <laughs> okay. They act like a shy kid in a classroom. They do. Wait till tomorrow morning when we meet at nine. They won't be shy. And <laughs> so um, I mentioned this earlier tonight downstairs. So effective collaboration is really beneficial when it's part of a system and it's embedded in the system. So we know that doctors are always reviewing and doing um, rounds together and reviewing patients and they're constantly learning. And they're learning from each other and from research, but they do that together. And lawyers review cases together and they learn from each other and they do more research and they learn from each other. Um, so they, and that's embedded in what they do. And it's part of their, their culture and their profession. As teachers, long ago, um, we really just shut the door and taught our own curriculum and it wasn't about improving and helping each other improve. And so the studies do show that the more you help each other, the better your system will be and you learn from each other. And we have expertise throughout 
our system, and we, we need to use those experts. So learning communities are crucial in creating a system where every classroom has effective teaching and learning. And as a community, when they meet as teachers and we have real intentional goals and they can look at data and they work on curriculum and build units together and look at student work, that's where we get effective teaching and learning because they're learning from each other. If I'm a fifth grade teacher and I bring math work, I bring a math assessment to a group of other fifth grade teachers and Kim's a fifth grade teacher and Kim's kids end up doing so much better on the assessment or on three questions, I can say, Kim, what did you do? What do your lessons look like? And share that. And so then you have consistency across. Um, it will also allow for us to have, we have somewhat consistent assessments now, but we haven't been able to look at that assessment results as a district. We also will have a data system, one data system, that they'll be able to get in. And as teachers, they'll be able to look at kids and um, look at each other's data, which is hard to do. And you need to be collaborative and have trust amongst the teachers to be able to look at classroom data together and to improve. It really opens, it opens your soul up and your learning. Um, so it's all about trust. So it's a collective responsibility. They share responsibilities and learning for all. So when teachers are working together across the district, it's not only about kids at Summit, but it's kids that if, if you're a first grade teacher in Summit, then you're also thinking about kids at the elementary school in Essex, Essex Elementary, and you're thinking about um, Hiawatha. And it's thinking about all kids. So as a leadership team, we think about all kids. When we, when we think about a vision, when we think about an action theory, it's not just about building base, but it's improving a whole system. Um, when, it, when professional learning occurs within, um, or when professional learning occurs within a learning community, it provides ongoing systems of support for continuous improvement. We have a continuous improvement plan, we've been working on one, and that helps um, implementation at a school and also across the system. And again, it's the accountability from teacher to teacher that you hold each other accountable when you said you were going to do something and you're trying to improve and you come back and show your peers. Um, that's what creates the alignment and it's that accountability in a system. And we're accountable as a leadership team also when we, we start to bring some work together um, and start to do some instructional rounds together and really looking at teaching and learning together. So it, the, along with the alignment and accountability, learning communities align their goals with the district. They can align their goals with a vision as a district and the continuous professional learning. And that's holding all members accountable to students. So when we have our goals as a district, we have our continuous improvement plan when it's complete, they, they will hold each other accountable and we have to hold them accountable. And through instructional rounds or however we do that when we're in classrooms, we can see the work that they've done together as a, as a team. And the continuous improvement, they can play, um, it's a cycle of improvement. They engage in inquiry, action research, data analysis, planning, implementation. They reflect and they evaluate. It's that continuous cycle for improvement. Providing time and opportunities for this effective collaboration. We have to, uh, the best way to do it is to create the embedded professional development structure that supports collaborative learning. And it can't be every four months or whatever we have now in a half a day. It, it's, you forget what you did when you were together before and it's like reintroducing them. So even though the half days this year have been effective for some vision work and bringing them together in the getting to know each other and building relationships. If we can take a deeper dive where they're together monthly and in their schools in PLCs or working groups um, on a weekly basis, but once a month across the district, that'll help build those relationships and trust. And so how do we want to do that? We want to provide a structure where intentional learning and collaboration happens for teachers and administrators. We want opportunities to meet district-wide on school-based goals and district-wide goals, and then um, create a district-wide learning communities that meet monthly. I skipped ahead in my, <laughs> in my speech. So what we're looking at, and this 
remember, could be changing, and this structure isn't set in stone. This is what we're, we're offering and providing and taking input. So the pre-K-8 uh, Tuesday early release, don't know why we picked Tuesday, it's faculty meeting and we just did. So th these days could change also. Students release at two or go to after school activities. We've been partnering and we need to do more of it and reach out to community partners to see what we can do with that hour. Maybe not send kids home, what can we do? Um, and then the staff would, with travel time, have 2.30 to four. So they'd have a 90 minutes. And then looking at the high school is a late arrival, and we learned this from colleagues down the road um, at Champlain Valley Union. They do a later um, arrival, and then they have their collaborative time in the morning. Listening to input from the community, we're thinking, if you click one more time, <laughs> there is, so this is my question, is are there benefits to having an early release straight across the same district? And there are and getting feedback from um, teachers and um, on whatever day that was, March 12th. We did hear a lot say it would be great to have that vertical alignment time and thinking about music, fine arts, um, nurses, guidance counselors that don't have that opportunity to really meet like that, um, <coughs> and special educators. And so I think we really, this is like a serious movement to do this, <laughs> is to really have it so it's an early release for all. Downstairs, when I was talking about it, I was thinking about that would help um, maybe some internships from the high school can go over to Summit Street in Hiawatha and Fleming where they can walk or bus some out to Essex Elementary and do something with kids for an hour um, and have high school kids and elementary kids buddy up, which we, uh, which we know that's, that's good too for kids of all ages. So the, um, this is what the teachers, we did a survey with them and what they would want to do during this collaborative time. Here's some of the, the summary of what came out and it's also what research says is, is how you improve a system and even get better. We're a great system, we need to get greater. There's, everybody can do that. We have a gap in learning. Um, we know that from Voices saw that, so we need some collaborative time to figure out and problem solve. We have um, pretty good SBAC scores when you compare them to the state, but we can do better. Why do we don't want to compare to Vermont and say, yeah, we're better than that. We are better than that, and we can get better, and that collaborative time will help us to do that. So all these um, reasons are what the teacher said and also what research says. And so the next steps is we need to go back to community partners and talk about, and daycare providers too, and talk about some possibilities on what we can do. And think about what's the best day. Today I said to Brian in the hallway, is Friday the best day? And then I thought, oh, when I was a teacher, I just wanted to go home on a Friday. I couldn't even think. And as an administrator, it's the same way. I don't want to cook dinner. I don't want to talk to anybody on a Friday night. <laughs> so, and I just, I can't imagine trying to do that and being really productive. I think we'd have a lot of ab absenteeism, absenteeism <laughs> um, with teachers, um, but that would be great for families. If you were gonna travel, you could pick up your kids at two and head out of town, but I don't think that's great for educators. Is Monday the best day? Get them, everybody while they're fresh. So that's something we have to um, think about and continue getting feedback from community members and administrators. We need to do some more thinking about it. So that's where we're at. Questions, comments from administrators? Yes. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, I'm Peter Farrell, the principal at Essex Elementary School, where we have been doing professional learning communities for probably seven years now uh, by our grade level teams working together. Um, what it has done for our school is uh, before we started working in, in professional learning communities, we all had the curriculum and every teacher went into their classroom and interpreted that curriculum the way it made sense to them. And then they implemented that curriculum on the timeline that made sense to them. And they compared their achievement and their results and their student results with themselves, without anybody else. And what we have done is moved to professional learning communities we used to have uh, four staff meetings a month on Tuesday afternoons. We gave up three of those in order to provide time for our teachers to have that common planning time. 
what they are, and that's and it's only an hour of common planning time, and they have so they are doing that hour, and they're also doing an hour during their lunch time and recess time. Each team is doing that, and what they're doing now is they are all they are all working together to design units. They're working to, together to design the common assessments that they give their students for those units. And then they're coming together and looking at those assessments. And just like Beth said, Kim, how did your students do that? And they're, so, so this creates a, it's a, the learning cycle that we talked about. And they are, they are plumbing their own depth of knowledge uh, for professional development. When I think about a district coming together, and I think about how that coming together has been so amazingly effective for our teachers in aligning their practices, in aligning their curricula, in aligning their assessments, and their learning, I don't see any other way really for us to accomplish that as a district when we have a single teacher in the second grade level out in Westford and we're separated and we're never sitting together to have those conversations. Um, the, the power of that is the, my kindergarten team today met in their PLC. Um, I was not able to be there. I was in an IEP meeting. I didn't have to worry about it because the kindergarten teacher leader who's incredibly effective at this Ran, ran that meeting and, and I get notes from that. She called me after the meeting saying, we want to invite the kindergarten teachers from across the district to come uh, next uh, April 3rd. We, uh, w you know, what do we need to do? I said, well, you need to email the principals of those schools to see if they're available. And then I was just sort of whispering to these guys about <laughs> expect an email and they said, oh, April 3rd is not going to work. We have this going on and this going. So while that collaboration is wonderful and incredibly effective, if it's not dedicated time, it, it becomes incredibly difficult. And we had to give up a lot as a when as the Essex Town School District, we had to give up a lot uh, of our of staff uh, meeting time and that sort of thing in order to enable that that common time, and it's paid off. Uh, Tenfold. Thanks. Other um, administrators who would like to comment, Dylan. Thanks. So I'll echo Peter's points. I think they're they're spot on. I, I, they're also very relevant to um, other staff who work across the district. For example, our special educators, our guidance counselors, and our nurses. You know, we also want them to be calibrated in their approach. We want to be coordinated in our approach and the current structure where we have a few half days and then really in-service days, primarily at the beginning and the end of the year. It's just it's an antiquated structure. It does not allow for consistent collaboration. And I think that moving to a model that offers some consistency um, and allows structures for collaboration will, will help um, us with, with all of our staff, not just our teachers, but with our, our other, other staff I mentioned as well. So I, I hope that we can move in this direction. I've worked in districts where we've had these structures and not, and I've, I've seen significant differences in the ability to, to move a district forward based, based on the structure that exists or, or doesn't. Thanks, Dylan. Other um, principals or administrators who would like to speak? Kevin. Yeah, I, I appreciate everything Peter's saying because I we started somewhat together with PLCs and the power of it has been incredible. I sat in a, in a PLC meeting this mo or this afternoon with my math folks, and not thinking really about this evening, but asking what was the to to, uh, to one of my teachers who is a master teacher in mathematics, uh, Karen Nee, and uh, she, she she completed the Vermont Math Institute, so she's a VMI graduate. But I asked her with everyone there. What is, what do you feel is the number one thing that you have done professionally that has changed your teaching to become where you're at today? And without even a second thought, it was working so closely with her Bath PLC. And I think about what growth that can have across the district so that we can truly say that a child who enters in Hiawatha, a child that enters at Essex Elementary School, has a very similar outcome when they make their, their way K through or pre-K through 12. And, uh, I think that's going to, this will pay dividends tenfold. So I'm excited 
I'm excited about the work that's, that's ahead. Um, I think um, one of the things that it says about a district who puts the time into a structure like this is that you're really putting your money where the work is. So in other words, it's an empowering um, stance for teachers to understand that my work is important, that talking with my colleagues and understanding what I teach and what I do and how my kids are doing and how I can support them is more important than listening to Kevin in his faculty meeting. In other words, it's, sorry, Kevin. But anyway, um, it, it really puts... Um, That's what they're listening to. It puts the, it really makes, a, it's a big message for teachers. It does put kids first. Um, it is about the kids and it's about kids learning and all learning that takes place. Um, but it really does speak to that investment that the district takes and makes to have a great system. So. And I just wanted to, uh, just one more piece about Peter's part and, and is that the reason it's successful is because of the amount of time that they're together. Mm -hmm. uh, that really is important. And you yeah. and Beth mentioned the four and a half days, whatever. Oh, whatever. It's four and a half days. It's really the work that they do throughout. And so when we were talking last Monday, you know, what is it that teachers need? And I asked that to the group, and they were talking about just time together to build trust. Because yeah. in order for this to be successful, you have to be really vulnerable uh, to be able to out to be able to say I don't know something in front of 20 of your peers is not easy. And uh, so that trust comes from time. And that, yeah. I'm going to have to wait two minutes for you. Yes. Um, I'm Catherine Griggin, I'm the principal at Hiawatha. And I have a couple of things to add, um, more so from a teacher perspective. I was part of the district where we had this um, format for five years. And I would echo everything that everyone's saying. The pieces that I would add is it got me really, really comfortable going into classrooms and having people come into my classroom and really give me effective feedback. It, it's that trust piece within a meeting, but it expands to yearning for feedback from your colleagues. And the other piece I would add is that it provides a chance for you to share how you get kids to grow in certain ways, but not just for struggling readers, also for an enrichment opportunity. And I found that as a teacher, I focused often on struggling learners and not the kids that really needed to be pushed further. And that type of collaboration helped me to implement things in my classroom that really pushed all learners. Thank you, Catherine. Any other principals or administrators who want to comment? All right, I'll open it up to the board for questions and comments and then I'll open it up to the audience. So Patrick? Um, maybe the principals would be best to answer this. Uh, how structured, like Peter, how structured is the time? Um, like when we have these meetings, you mentioned that you have a teacher leader. So assume that we implement this across the district. Uh, how do you find those teacher leaders? Do you get volunteers? Do you have people in mind? And then once we do have that, you know, for 90 minutes every week, um, you know, is there like, you know, uh, a schedule that they would follow or is there some sort of implementation plan about what we're going to talk about the first week, the second week, the third week? Like, I just kind of want to get an idea of how it works. We had um, uh, carefully <laughs> selected volunteers as our teacher leaders uh, initially. Um, it, there was a, a, a there was a, a big learning curve for everybody about what PLCs <coughs> mean, um, how do they function, how are they different from just a regular sort of staff meeting. Um, our teacher leaders uh, went to workshops and conferences with the leadership team to learn more about facilitation, to learn about uh, the functioning of PLCs. Um, we, as a leadership team, had a lot of discussions about uh, loose tight leadership here are the things that we're really tight about these are the things that have to happen here's the here's the sort of wiggle room so I think initially we were um, we we were we placed trust in teachers to know what to discuss but we followed up very intensely on what was discussed and what was the agenda and you know what, who was participating in the agenda and all of, you know, I collected all formative assessments that were given 
just to sort of get things moving, to get that ball rolling. Now I have a, a, a site where I, the agendas are posted by the, for the, the uh, PLC, <coughs> the notes. I can pop in, look at the notes, they can, or I'll be invited to PLCs. I try to keep my Tuesdays free so that I can go and visit with each of them at least, you know, at least for 20 minutes every Tuesday. Um, but they, at this point, with oversight, are essentially functioning themselves with teacher leaders uh, uh, designing agenda based on feedback from their, their cohorts. Awesome. Great. Thank you. I just want to add one thing to that as well. The, uh, is that we're, for Essex Town, we're, we're seven years in. We're actually on our, for my school, for Essex Middle School, we're on our second round of teacher leaders. So it's, you're not, you aren't uh, forever the teacher leader. Is that we build capacity within. So uh, those, the, the same teacher leader, you know, Karen E, I mentioned her earlier, she was the initial teacher leader. She took a lot of the bumps and bruises on how to become a PLC. Uh, and then Phil Young is now my teacher leader, even though she's still in there as part of it. And I think that's really an important piece is to continue building capacity, uh, just building those leaderships, but not just throwing them in there expecting to do it, but there was very intentional training. Yeah, I was gonna add to that that um, the other thing the principals do in the Essex schools is they meet weekly with their teacher leaders to talk to them about how the process is working for them and if they need help with anything or if they have a celebration that they want to share so that Kevin, Peter, and Wendy all know sort of the, the, the feel of the PLC and how it's going and how they can support them. We did a lot of training with the PLC teacher leaders. Um, each leader has been asked or was asked to be a leader for three years. So we wanted continuity, con continuity across the process so that um, it wasn't, you know, you're in for a year and then somebody else new comes in. These are delicate conversations um, and they are relational, and so it becomes really important. And sometimes the leaders don't work, and they, they notice that or feel that, and so then we problem solve and try to figure that out. But for the most part, we've had really, really good success. And I would say the teachers, if, you, if we think about intentionality, they are more intentional than we would ask them to be. They do more work than we ever said you had to do, um, and they really value that time. Thanks, um, Kim? Um, just having been there through it as a board member, <coughs> it was pretty amazing to see the transformation. And as both a board member and parent, it felt as though it was a really tremendous opportunity to create equity in our system in terms of the experience and the shared expertise among educators. Um, it let you feel confident that um, if one teacher was especially good at a particular way of getting at things that was shared among their colleagues. Mm -hmm. And it was it was very dramatic to see that change over those years. And um, hearing unsolicited from teachers on it um, often, and some who maybe weren't so embracing of the idea initially, it the profound impact they feel it's had on their ability to um, learn with their kids and with their colleagues on behalf of kids um, spoke volumes. So it was really awesome to see. Okay. Other questions or comments from board members? Keith and then Brenda. I just have a minor detail <coughs> question regarding the day of the week issue. My understanding when we started this conversation was that Tuesdays were selected for early release because the faculty meeting on that day meant that in the teacher's contract, <coughs> it was specified that they stayed longer on that day. Am I mistaken about that? And the contract is flexible about what I day? I it specifies the day, okay. <coughs> the time that's there. Gotcha. Cool. Is that correct? That's what I'm recalling. Well, my recall about this we're sitting here. <laughs> I think that's that one day. Um, Brendan? Uh, um, so I'm, I'm curious. <coughs> So currently with the PLPs and um, in what's imagined as more district-wide professional learning and, and consultation, how do we measure the impact of that work? Do we see it in student outcomes? Do we see it in 
employee satisfaction? Like where, where, how do you measure the success of, of this model? That's a great question. And I would say yes to both of those. And also when our leadership team has our action plan, our theory of action, which we're working on, we will set strategies and then we will set, okay, so how are we going to evaluate those strategies? Um, and I see us in the future doing a lot of walkthroughs together and, and getting that anecdotal um, information also. But yes, and student outcomes, definitely. And that alignment across the um, district would be, is, is powerful. But in the, in the schools that have adopted PLPs already and have been using yeah. them for a number of years, have we seen improved student performance in those schools? I can answer that. Yeah. Are you talking about PLCs or PLPs? I'm sorry, PLPs. PLCs, PLCs sorry. PLCs, right? Professional Learning Community. Oh, PLCs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. That's why so. It's hard to keep them. <laughs> so I can, I can say that uh, we will look at class, we look at team data. Okay, and over the years, I can say that there are certain teams that, that perform better than other teams. Okay, it's just, it's just the nature of it. And I can also say that when the teams have begun working together, those become closer. It doesn't, they don't shrink, but rather the team that wasn't performing, say as well, <coughs> their instruction has increased and they have better performing. Mm -hmm. They really do, it's, it's a remarkable thing. I don't know if Peter wants to jump in. No, I, I think it, uh, like any, you see fluctuations from year to year based on the cohort of children that you're uh, working with. But we've seen a steady, uh, a steady slow increase in our scores. Um, we do still have the gaps that Beth was talking about, which I think is gonna be a huge, uh, not a huge challenge, but I think is our next big challenge, is how to address that because that seem we we have sort of hit a wall with that at this point. So the other piece, Brendan, that's happening in, in those PLCs in that way is that they're doing different types of assessments and they're doing more common formative assessments across their grade levels, which then get reflected in the local district data. So you've got more real time assessing happening at the instructional level or moment, and so the movement for a kiddo is. Um, it's more secure, do you know what I mean? There's more options for a teacher to intervene because every four weeks or so, they're, they're looking at a unit, they're saying what's the question that we have to solve on this one. They look at student work and then they're, they're working that out in real time. So the, everything would point to the fact that it should show up <laughs> as you go through. Yeah. Liz? I just want to comment, we just had our first of three community conversations around proposed changes to start and stop times and are just trying to get a sense of community support around that. And while not every, there were more than 50, I don't know how many people were there, probably about, si 60. about 60 people in the room. And so just quickly from the, re from the real time polling that we did, it's clear that, that people in that room find collaborative uh, planning a priority and that um, if we were do, to do things in stages or all at once, everyone in the room, that most of the people in the room tonight thought all at once, we want to make these changes and see it happen. So that, that <laughs> came from the participation tonight. And just for viewers, that poll is live and we'll share the link and make sure that you have access to weigh in on your own thoughts around, around these things. And, and, and please do that because it's really important input for all of us. Thanks, Liz. I'm going to oh, one more, and then I'm going to uh, open it up to the community. Oh, I just want to say, state something before we go much further, but you can. Okay. <coughs> My question is, because Town of Essex, we're talking a lot about them, what happens when you have um, Westford, you've got Hiawatha Summit as an example, you've got the Essex Elementary School, what happens as a leadership team if you see one school that is consistently not uh, being able to meet. I mean, we're depending, in this case, you're gonna be depending upon the principals are doing their evaluations of staff yep. and that you're doing the evaluations of your principals. So when we talk about goals, how do we know from the superintendent that we've met the goals, that we're seeing the evaluations done of staff and of principals? Because 
I don't remember us seeing much of that. We just assumed always it was being done. My questions have usually been about was it being done? And obviously, if things weren't satisfactory, then something came to us about changing personnel. Right. So that's something that doesn't go to a board, the evaluations of principals or, or of staff. I guess that's when you have to put your faith and trust in your superintendent that will work to improve and continuous improvement in all of us, just as I need it, and you work with me on that. Um, but that's not really to show an evaluation to a board. If there were issues, I guarantee I would be talking to you about it. And I, I think I have shown and proven that this year with some um, staff, not necessarily principal. Right. Beth, was there something you wanted yes. to say before? So I don't, want it, I don't want this conversation to end without me stating that, because we've been focused on the prior Essex town. These conversations and work does happen in the former CCSU. Um, I'm looking at Suzanne and thinking like, yeah, they do do PLCs. They don't call them that. Or they did at one time. Um, Catherine has a set time in the middle of the day, which this will free up that. Um, to be able to help her teachers do that. So they have a different kind of schedule, um, which is pretty hard to meet, both financially and finding time. So this will definitely help Hiawatha. Marcy, I know that they look at data and they work together, and it's just not formally called a PLC. So I don't want anybody to leave here thinking like other schools aren't doing that. So. Yes. I think it's important, um, Kevin mentioned this earlier, um, the power of putting people together. Um, comes from relational trust and it also comes from training and I can speak directly about Westford scores in terms of what you can see with that we're you know a small school so pulling five to six um, teachers together really empties their building to do those kind of things during the school day and it's been tricky and so we've worked really hard over the last few years with a single um, focus on writing because their data and writing um, was relatively weak compared to our reading and math scores. And we utilized the PLC model. I didn't have a teacher leader or money for training for that, but we did have some funding through the curriculum director for using a consultant that act essentially worked as the PLC leader. Our writing scores over the last three years have continued to grow and are um, above the state average, and we're, we're very proud of that. We would do the same in this model, except we wouldn't be paying a consultant we would be working with teachers across the district because we actually have that expertise in the building. What we didn't have is the time to pull it off. Right. And I, it, you know, it is, it's a structural change. The things my teachers um, are concerned about and the teacher um, group that I led during in-service to get feedback was really thoughtful about what the impact will be on families. You know, we don't want to dismiss students early if we don't have quality programming for them and planning for them. We don't want to send kids home to an empty house you know, we're at pre-K-8 school, we think about, you know, what that would look like, and we don't want to give up instructional time during the day. And so we've already started working on some scheduling ideas and trying to partner. I know Brian has reached out already with other organizations, and Catherine and Dylan and I came from a, a different system in which this worked pretty well, but they had a solid infrastructure with busing and those kind of things. So I, I trust that if this is the work and the focus that we want to do that we'll do it well and that that will mean moving pretty quickly on all the details about how we communicate that with families and what kinds of services we can provide that are affordable and or subsidized in some way so that kids get the benefit of both ends they get the benefit of really quality teaching that only continues to get better and they have something to do during that time in which we're all working yeah that is appropriate and not poorly staffed. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Um, any community members want to comment or ask a question? Yes. I just want to say I'm a parent in the, in the district, but I'm also a speech pathologist in another school district. So um, sort of what Dylan was saying, I'm the only speech pathologist in the high school that I work in. So I have sort of see it in two different ways. I get to collaborate with my peers, with my teachers, um, and have an input in regular ed in a way that I wouldn't in, in a department meeting. I also get time, um, depending on what's going on, because I have to you know I have to figure out if it's a building-based day or I can meet with my district speech pathologist. But it's the only time.
then I get to see other speech pathologists. I have special educators in my building, no other speech pathologists. So it's invaluable in being able to meet with other professionals. But it's not just alignment, which is what I hear all the principals saying. It's professional development. We've brought our own professional development in. I work in a high school, so in the high school level, it's been our opportunity to really work on um, proficiency-based graduation, what that looks like since the state rolled that out, gave it to us. You know, you guys all know that they just handed it to us. They didn't say, what do you guys think? They said, you guys have to do this, you figure it out. Um, we've used it to align our PLP time and what that looks like across the board. So it's been, I work with people I would never work with on a regular basis, um, and I get to work with people who actually know what my profession is and can do professional development in a way that I've never been able to do before. So and I, both as a parent and as an educator, not an administrator, see this as being hugely important to the educators in, in this district. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience want to comment or ask a question? Yes, Kat. Um, you I'm, should state your name. I'm sorry, I should ask you your name too. I'm Wendy Chafee. Thank you. I'm Kaki McGeary. Um, I think it's wonderful that the district is looking at this, and I, I love um, hearing about how this is already working in all of the schools in our district. I'm wondering um, a couple of things. One, um, will this new time um, replace the time that? people are currently spending um, on the personal learning communities, PLCs, or is it in addition to? It sounds like in, I just, um, that may be different in depending on the building. And the other question is about um, the financial cost um, for any sort of um, after school programs or um, other kinds of enrichment activities that you might have while students are maybe being released early. Has the di district set aside funds um, to help pay for those things? Uh, because I feel that there should be no um, financial impact to families um, for this change. Mm -hmm. I feel that that's something that the district should invest in. So we have talked with some community partners about right now they um, lease our building could we work out a deal when they give the free daycare and we take away that lease? The lease isn't that much, but it would cover that piece. I know, and that same community partner does that um, in Champlain Valley School District. Um, so that's for that extra hour. There's other things. Um, my daughter works in that district and she runs an after school, um, a homework club during that time. So it's an hour that they didn't used to have that's run um, by a paraeducator who's educated. Um, so there's opportunities like that that we have to look at. I think once we have this structure, then the opportunities will even um, bubble up more and we can really think about it. And our kids in the building is the most important thing. That's why we're going for this, but we also need to take care of them in that time. I would love to see nobody go home at three. I mean at two. <laughs> <laughs> and can you ask, answer Kaki's first question about what happens to the PLC oh, time? That's something that, that we haven't with. discussed yet, and I was I was thinking that we really haven't talked about that as a leadership team. I can I know that I have <coughs> talked about it with Catherine um, at Hiawatha, but I haven't talked about it with Peter yet, and I, I don't want to answer that without talking about that because they may find um, at Founders and Essex Elementary, they need professional development time because they're picking up Bridges, which is used in the other schools. Bridges is a new math program to them. So they may find that time really effective to use that. Um, and we, right now we don't have PLCs across the district. So that those collaborative learning time would happen you know, at least once a month across the district. But I think it's really, we have to look at each individual school and what meets their needs, their professional development needs, and their um, PLC timing. And maybe Peter's teachers, that works best for them there, and they've figured out that schedule. And on the Tuesdays, they could do the bridges work, or vice versa. So there's always learning opportunities, and there's always so much to learn and to move forward. And the high school, um, and Wendy just said it, is it's incredible with the amount of work that they could be doing around proficiency-based learning and grading and all of that. And they need the time to do that. We, 
we're stretched. Okay, any other um, questions from the audience? Can you get the last question or comment? It was just a clarifying question about where time is going. Um, the, my understanding was that we are, if we go to this um, system, we are getting rid of the half day early releases that are scattered through the year. Okay. 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 Thank you, everyone. Um, and I hope you're going to stay for a little bit more, but if the principals have to leave, it was great to have you here. All right. And so we're going to move on now to the vision. And Beth, who is leading this? Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our draft vision in a video. So we asked um, staff, uh, teachers and support staff, to react to that vision. Um, last Monday, they worked, each um, administrator had a group that they worked with on a um, task, and then they entered data and gave us feedback. Um, the feedback was mostly positive, and if we think about grade level, it has to be, the vision has to stretch pre-K to 12. So some of the upper high school said it's pre-K-ish, but if you really take out and just look at the words and not a video, which I think was confusing, um, the video is not our vision, it's the words within the vision. So overall, it was great feedback. We had, I can't even remember how many responses now. We had 242 responses oh. in that um, element during that Okay. And a lot of them did that as a group, so they entered the data as 15 people sitting around. So there's a lot of responses. We had over 76% of those responding that, that um, graded the vision to be a three or a four in a scale of four as inspiring. Um, and only eight, uh, under 9% that were at a one, so needing some more time with it or yeah. even understand it or see how it was. The vision also needs to flex and stretch, not only for just our instructional side, but also all the operations side, within our other support staff, within our community as a whole. So we see the vision to be uh, sort of multi-dynamic and flexible that way. And tomorrow night, the arts night, we would have been able to give you feedback, but it was delayed because of the snow day. So Voices for Education will be there with a table tomorrow night, and it's on a big banner. People will be get, have the opportunity to write on it, draw on it, whatever you want with markers. Um, there'll be some laptops there where you can view the video and get on and give um, feedback right away. And there, you can also do that on your cell phone. So there'll be instructions on the table with voices so they can, so we get community feedback around it and families and kids. So students, we were going to take it to advisories. We're reworking that and I'm working, um, had a conversation with Jamal last night about how can we do that and maybe it's um, some kids and Brian and I going to, around to advisories to get feedback. But we have a little more time before it comes back to you as a final. <laughs> yeah, I think our, <clears throat> our timeline is made right. for the board to approve the right. vision. I just wanted to say the reason I like a simple, easily remembered vision is years ago I went to a national conference 
And when I met a couple of superintendents, they handed me their business card. And on the back of the business card was their vision. So I came back, Mike DeWeese was the superintendent at that time, we as boards worked really hard. And it was so wordy, I was like, I was just floored because what was on the back of that card was exactly all the words we had used but done very simply. So I thought that was very professional. You could have a principal or a superintendent or your staff. You have your business cards, here you go. I just thought. And the words will come in our belief statements and values around that and also in our path on how we get to that vision. That's where more words will come in. But this vision um, right now is a draft vision, is very easy to remember. Um, and it, when I see it or hear it, I really think about a lot of kids' voice in it. Um, so that's important. Questions, comments? I, I really like the way you brought me this out. Any questions or comments from the audience? Okay. Let's move on to an um, update and review of the National School Walkout. Yeah, um, it couldn't come tonight. So that's too bad. Do you, do you uh, Brian yeah um, I uh, I attended um, was spent my time in one of the parking lots just observing and kind of monitoring some of the traffic inflow and outflow uh, what I saw and heard was probably about maybe 500 students that participated I wasn't in the building so I would imagine that um, that was done all our staff remained in classrooms and kids that didn't choose or opt to do it were uh, were invited to just stay there. Uh, there was quite a weather element to it. Mm -hmm. um, despite, you know, postponing for a, a snowstorm, that snow just still consisted and, and stayed there. So it took place on the bleachers. There was a series of speakers starting off with some of the student organizers, as well as um, state representatives were invited, other people were invited to speak and intermixed in there were three minute uh, intervals of silence for, and each one of the victims um, in the Parkland shooting was, their name was read off so that uh, the moments of silence were specific for um, individual victims. So, and then they proceeded back in. The total thing was probably under 60 minutes of time from beginning to end. Great, Kim? I can share, um, Nick is actually not here. He's preparing testimony to, to go to the State House tomorrow and has some work to make up for getting down there and time to sign up. Um, but he did, I did ask him if he wanted to, to share some thoughts on behalf of students. So um, he said it felt like it gave the, the student speakers in between had an opportunity to really express some of the anger and fear and frustration in, in their sharing their statements. Um, it was pretty personal, I think, to those students who spoke. Um, and he thought there were somewhere in the order of around 400 kids who participated. Um, he said the people who did were respectful of the people who didn't, and he felt vice versa, that there wasn't sort of a division among students' decisions around that. Um, he thought that it was good for the student community the length and the weather might have had some impact. And I think intentionally, um, the two representatives were there, were asked to hit on particular topics. And I think um, that maybe one went a little bit longer or was a little bit more sort of, this is what you could do from a political standpoint. Um, and that that might have felt a little political. And that was the only, um, the, the weather, was and and that was the element that he thought was the only criticism he heard, and it wasn't widespread. But um, he generally, I think, he felt that the students who participated and planned were um, it was good for the community. Thanks, Kim. Um, just a second, um, Kevin. Do you want to talk about what happened at Essex Middle School? No. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so we had about a nine minute 
because it was 15 below, I think, on that day, uh, walk out. Uh, there were probably maybe 100 kids. It was probably about a quarter of the school, which is very similar to that of the high school. I found that to be interesting. I had uh, five young ladies, eighth graders, meet with me on the, on the Monday we returned from vacation uh, to try to organize some sort of a walk out. Um, uh, I th they were incredibly poised in, in, uh, in their desire to do so. And uh, they didn't really have a plan on that Monday, so I met with them. I said, your homework is to have something in the works for Friday. I met with them on Friday, and what they wanted to do was to have an opportunity to uh, celebrate the lives of the 17 victims from Florida. Uh, so uh, this past week, we actually did that. Uh, we went out front. It was 10 when we started, probably 10.04 when we actually started the presentation. Uh, one of the one speaker talked about the, the lives and, and the tragedy of that. Uh, one other speaker talked about her wish for more gun control. Um, and then it was followed by the names of each of the victims and they placed a rose down uh, for each of the each of the victims. Uh, like I said, it was about nine minutes. Uh, they talked quickly. We were supposed to do a moment of silence in between, but they, their hands were pink. Um, and, uh, but I think the, the, it was as, I think it was as well as a middle school and very appropriate for a middle school uh, setting. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Questions and comments from board members, Andre? Um, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, anonymous students that showed up on the Wednesday and erected um, 17 snowmen. I'm not sure if you're aware of that or not, but I thought that was uh, interesting. Actually, when I came to the Tettle Center Honor Society ceremony, they were, they were still out working on them. Okay. Yeah. So it was at the high school. And yeah, the, the it's snow, right. they're still out there. On, yeah. on the snow it's day. Teachers that teachers. that started that. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yes. On the snow day, they were here building snowmen. Nice. Okay. Any other questions or comments from board members? Diane. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I attended in the same parking lot with Brian. Um, and uh, great minds think alike. Um, the, uh, I thought the students did an excellent job. I'd like to see if the follow through from the invitation from our house reps is, goes with it because the, it sounded like the speakers that were that day, um, the student speakers that day, um, <coughs> did have the feeling that they were looking at next steps. And I guess I'd like to encourage them to take the next steps of this civil activity um, and to follow through. I read lots of comments from parents saying that this was not a productive activity for the student body. And quite frankly, I think this was a very productive activity for students to learn about how their civil rights and their civil responsibilities and how what you have to do to be a citizen. I thought it was an excellent example and I heartily um, support the student body in continuing on. Thanks, Diane. Brendan? Yeah, I just wanted to express my appreciation for um, school leaders and district uh, leaders in supporting the students to um, have as uh, productive, productive as an experience while also not disrupting students who chose not to participate. Um, I thought it was a really fine line that, that you walked, and I thought it was really well balanced. So I just wanted to thank you for um, navigating a, a tricky situation, um, but also giving students um, an opportunity to express themselves, whereas I'm sure we've heard other districts where the, the um, reaction and response from school administration was quite different. So thank you. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say a very similar thing about the support from the administration and the comments about and the direction that the administration is moving around really supporting student-led initiatives. 
Um, and if it comes from the student body, it's going to be it, the, it, w it. It's likely to get support if it's if the topic is generated. And I really appreciate that approach to it. The challenge is the younger kids who can't organize that way and still want to have a voice. And middle school is middle learners. But what about the pre-K? And and this conversation has also come up in the community. How <coughs> do we support? Um, this district-wide when and not as just the older kids who have the strength and the capacity to organize and and know at more what they want and what kind of support they need so it's just something for us to think about as these rise we've heard a lot of comments about what about you know what about my kid at Essex Elementary and and how do I help them and understand this these issues so I think it's important for us to remember that it's pre-k through 12 where these conversations are taking place and the support is needed. I, I echo what Diane has said about next steps and I think of that because of Nick being our student representative. It was very powerful, the students, the fear that they have uh, really hits you and I've told some younger parents at work that I work with I'm probably older than most. Martha might be there with me. Uh, when we went through the Vietnam War, I was in high school. Drugs came into Waitsfield and Harwood, and it was turmoil. We had a very wise principal back then, and he allowed for sit-ins in the office. And I can remember we were torn. You, had, you either believed in the war or you were against it. My mother was for it, my father was against it. It was so much turmoil that after I heard Nick's letter, I got to thinking there is more that probably as a board or as schools or whatever, that fear is there and it's very legitimate and then you got the school shooting, another one today. So, I don't know. It's a hard time. Any other questions or comments from board members? Okay, from the audience. I know you came for this topic. Right, yeah, my name's Earl Barber. I have had three children complete high school here, and I've got another child that's in middle school, so most of my focus will be on what happened at Essex Middle School. Uh, that said, it's interesting to find out what's been going on with these other schools, and you know, I, I don't have a problem with the True Memorial, and I don't have a problem with the true walkout, but that's not what this was, okay? Calling it student-led is a misnomer, as I think. Okay, this was, no matter how you want to spin this, this was connected to a political group, Women's March. I had a teacher send me an email saying, hey, your t there's gonna be a group of students, address your children in homeroom and to help about what's happening on the walkout, Here's the link so you can get further information. That link went straight to a Women's March uh, website. Okay, and it is for gun, gun control. Okay, whatever you want to do with gun control, that's not really the issue. What, what bothers me the most about all of this was that a political agenda got into the school and was presented. It doesn't matter if it's student-led Okay, it got into the school, it was presented to a captive audience. Okay, there may have been children there, students there, who don't want to hear this, can't comprehend this. Okay, that's, they, they're a captive audience. Now, what happens when you let one political agenda in, is you gotta let all of them in now. Okay, you've just opened the door to allow everybody with a political agenda to get students to act as their proxy to go inside the classroom and have a right to preach at our kids. Now, this one's for gun control, okay? It's, it's sad that we have to do this. Adults can't even agree on this. I don't know why we're putting this on the children. Adults can't agree on this. Uh, so, if you, so for gun rights, okay, I don't really care what happens with this, but what about the next political agenda. What do you want? Uh, do you want uh, abortion rights to be up next? Pro-life? Is that going to be presented next? How about uh, pro-choice? KKK, they have agendas as well. Should we let them into the schools to present to a captive audience? Black Lives Matter? The list goes on and on and on. 
Okay, but the door's wide open now. I think it has to be closed. These children are too young to really understand what's going on. There are studies, you could Google it. You know, when does a, fully, when does a human mind <coughs> fully develop? And make up your own mind, your own research, but it's after 20, the, the main consensus. There may be cherry-picked studies that say it's younger, but I can cherry-pick studies that say it's older, okay? And I know from having children of that age and watching their friends, they don't really think rationally. Not, not really, not to the degree that adults can. That's why they can't vote. So that's my concern. I, I don't want any other political activity going on in the school. And I certainly don't want our schools, you know, helping this along. I mean, we told the children at the Essex Middle School, okay, this is where we want you to go and stand. Uh, then there was a gym. We, we actually arranged for senators and state representatives to come in and talk and, they, and gun rights was brought up. Again, captive audience. Kids are going there thinking it's for one thing and it turns out to be for another. And this happens more than you think. First of all, case in point, fall of 2011, there was a student here at EHS who was beat up at Maple Street Park. And all the kids were all upset in the high school because that kid was beat up by his bullies. So they had a sit-in. The whole high school practically poured into the gym. All right, guess what happened when the news cameras showed up? Some representative came up to him and said, hey, they're here to support gay rights. Okay, that is not what these children signed up for. My daughter was one of them, and I know what their friends were thinking, I know what she was thinking. Okay, they were misrepresented for a political agenda. Okay, now let's back this up as to what happened at Essex Middle School. <clears throat> Okay, I spoke with Kevin Briggs about this. He said he was going to help these students and pull out the parts that would be controversial, things that, you know, so it wouldn't be about gun control. It's going to be truly memorial service, right? Okay, say that truly does happen. Fine, okay, the kids go out there and they have their memorial service. I don't know if gun rights was brought up or not. I can't control what the kids are saying. But I tell you this much, what was reported in the Burlington Free Press was that Essex Middle School was supporting the women's right, the women's march movement. I don't know how they found that out, but all I know is that there were kids at that service who were represented in the news as supporting gun rights, and that's not what they were there for. I think as school administrators and the school board, you should not allow our children to be politicized <coughs> like that. They should not be pawns in an adult game, okay? That's what this is. <laughs> All right, thanks. Do you want to respond to Mike Kim? I was just going to offer, um, Mr. Barber, our student representative was not able to be here tonight. He, um, he brought from the students on February 20th, which was our first meeting after the shooting. We didn't ask him to do anything of the sort. But he had so many comments from students he knew and didn't know across the district on the impact of that shooting and how they felt and how many of these students who are juniors now were to be kindergartners when the shooting happened in Essex Elementary. So he brought forward a very powerful statement on behalf of students and a portion of it was about a wish for there to be better control and safety at around guns, but the majority of it was around how students are feeling in their environment as students who are living around this far more than any of us would ever like to imagine. So I think our responsiveness appropriately was to absolutely a student-led initiative. Those students were very thoughtful and mindful of how they would want for that to be brought forward and work directly with the principals. Um, he, he read it again when we took up the resolution um, on school safety and gun control as a board. So he read it a second time. So it's in our minutes and it would be in both recorded meetings. And it is truly, I think, a big part of what guided our, our need to be responsive to what students felt they needed to do. And that was particular to the, the high school, but I think, um, I don't think that it's, they have to be 20 to be able to have their feelings and express them. And I think that 
finding ways to honor and respect differences around that, but provide avenue for their voice was what we as a board were expecting the administration would do, particularly in response to the most impactful statement I've ever heard in all my years of board service from shared from our student completely unsolicited because of what he was hearing from kids across the high school. So I do hope if you have time you would take it. It's a, I think it's three minutes when he reads it on the video, but it is also attached as a document to our minutes from the last meeting, which was March 8th, I think. I don't know, whatever. I think it was the 8th. And then also I think on the, it, it probably also got attached to the February 20th minutes. And that just might be helpful to provide perspective for where the student initiative, where voice came to it. So I'm not going to turn this into a back and forth discussion. Finish. I didn't get to finish. Well, uh, I, you know, we have a lot more on our agenda. You spent a half hour on something I patiently waited for. I should be able to speak my mind. I think so. Do you have something to say that you haven't already said it? I do. You're missing the point. The point is getting any political agenda in here. I don't care what it's about. Like I said, if you are going to allow this to happen, okay, I, I am darn well going to demand that if there's a group of students who want to talk about pro-life issues at the school, that they are given equal time and equal uh, captive audience, as it were, okay? I'd rather that not happen, I really do. I wish you as a board would make that decision that you do not allow this to happen. You're the adults. He may have given a very empowered speech. Like I said, there are going, these are studies. Anybody can cherry pick anything you want. There are going to be exceptions to the rule, but by the rule, those kids are not capable. Middle school kids cannot rationalize this. Keely. Um, I think Marla had something to contribute before, but. No, I, I just want to say, I think the point of view from this gentleman is very apropos about political um, things coming into schools and the kids being captive audiences. So however we go in the future, I think we have to be very careful, even if it's student-led, that we watch out uh, very carefully how it progresses. Um, because I think Kim even alluded that Nick had mentioned that there was a political piece that did happen. I think, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent it, it was that both representatives were asked to respond to something particular that the students who were organizing asked, and I think, I think Lori Houghton was asked to say what, what are other things that students can do? So that, you know, became a little bit longer, and it yeah. was around like, yeah. what can students so do to carry I, I, their voice I, forward? I so think, I don't want to yeah. misrepresent it, I just I wasn't think, there, I he think was what he's encouraging the, is being careful and uh, not crossing any lines. So my suggestion is gonna be that um, I don't really wanna restrict the political expression of high school students, um, but I do think that you have a point in regards to transparency, that if student initiatives are affiliated with external organizations, that other students choosing to participate in the activity should be aware, made aware of that. So for instance, if there was some event for Veterans Day and it was sponsored by the Boy Scouts and the Air Force, that all students participating would know this is an Air Force sponsored activity or whatever. Um, and then they would know if they wanna show up. We can't do anything about what the free press says our students are doing. Though our current policy that we're reviewing about um, visits by the media does put some restrictions on whether any names of students and whether students can be photographed in the future by external media. So hopefully that'll resolve the issue of like your daughter being photographed and attributed something that she didn't believe in. Now, my, my issue was in line with what she was saying. Giving them instruction time to promote a political agenda. That's what my issue is. Thank you. Um, I've, Wendy. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I, I can totally understand what Earl is saying. I disagree a little bit, but I do think that it, it, as opposed to being a political movement, maybe teaching kids how to have the conversation. Um, 
as opposed to making a political move. There was, there was a political statement there, whether you are for it or against it. And that, for me, right now, I'm not even going to go there. But um, the fact that adults are not able to have conversations about a whole lot of things, I think there's a way that you can use this or, and other issues to teach kids how to have the difficult conversations across the board. I actually have to say I was um, surprised and impressed. Um, my kids did participate. There were comments made to them by their friends about them participating because they were their friends weren't participating, and then they went on. So they had some, you know, there was, you know, some derogatory comments, which I was kind of surprised. But then they were like, okay, you know, you believe that, and I believe that, and we're going to move on. And that. I think is bigger than some of our adults. So teaching, um, teaching kids how to have that conversation and how to disagree respectfully, I don't think is m mismanaged. But I don't disagree that it was a political agenda, but it was a political agenda started by high school students who had just had a shooting in their school. And then there was a movement for other students who said, yeah, <laughs> and joined in. So I think I think there is a place to have to teach them how to have the conversations because I don't think adults really know how to have those conversations well. And I think it's too bad in some ways that it did get connected to the Women's March because I really do believe that from the beginning this was a student-led initiative out of Parkland. Kaki. Uh, as a parent who cried on that day, you know, I really appreciated the opportunity and I guess the, the space for kids to be able to express their feelings. Um, I, I totally understand what you are saying and I respect it. Um, I, I just, I struggle with how do you, how do you give that space um, to kids and not turn it into a political debate. And so I, I don't know where the, what the answer is, but I, I hear what you're saying. I do just want to say that as someone with a student at the middle school, um, I didn't get, I got one e communication about the, this lockout, whatever memorial was happening. I read that it was not, it was from Kevin. Um, and it was very, I thought, very thoughtful. It was not political at all. It, it specifically said that that was not the point. It was about, um, you know, doing a memorial for the children who had died. And then um, I, I didn't get anything about Women's March or anything like that from any of Charlie's teachers. So I, I just wonder if that was a isolated email that, that perhaps another teacher sent that out on their own. I, I don't feel that that was a school-wide thing, and I just wanted to clarify that that was not my experience as far as what communication came home for our family. Thank you, Kathy. All right, I think I'd like to move on. I, to really quick, point. just to your point about the board's uh, role in allowing this or not allowing it, the ACLU has a really uh, informative website about the rights of the students in protests and what the school can and cannot do around that. I, I, ACLU.org and, and types student rights for walkouts or protests, and you can get a whole lot of information and some clarity around what what we can as an administration and as board members do. You're right, it, it, conversations that, that come, it's a free speech issue and how we handle it as an administration and, and as a board is important, but there are limitations as to what, what we can do when they, when they arise. And there's a lot of information there about students' rights. Um, I would encourage you to, to, to check it out. Yeah, it is something that we looked at as board members. All right, thank you. All right, school is starting in times. Um, update on public and staff engagement about this subject. Brian? Yes, yeah, so um, on a staff wide basis, there was some um, discussion, as Beth uh, alluded to, there was some. Um, Q&A and some time for staff to feedback about if given this recurring time how would they use it uh, there has been um, a number of different opportunities for people to weigh in but this evening we started to establish a new route and Liz do you want to kind of key off of 
our experience? Yeah, I, I thought it was great. And the feedback that I heard from the people in the room was really appreciating this, this way of going about as opening it up as a question and really, as Brian put it, being vulnerable up there to say we don't have the answers. And I feel like that can be scary. And, 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 and tonight it was clear that it was appreciated, that there was a lot of complexities to this and, and that the, fa the way of doing it, um, of opening up an hour long conversation um, that will build on one after the other is I think um, I, I'm fi finding a lot of really good, good uh, feedback and a lot of positive and a lot of support for that direction. Uh, there were about uh, 60 people probably there it was a conversation. It generated a, a lot of questions, and and also we we challenged people to um, to come up with some solutions, not just the problems. And so we have a lot of information that we will will collect now and use that to inform the meeting on April third. Um, and and I hope that uh, it will be as well as it, this. It was great to see so many people there and being very thoughtful about about these changes. And to me, I, as I already said tonight. The, the support for that collaborative t time was loud and clear, and this idea of we can just go for it. It doesn't have to take us 10 years. That, that kind of attitude um, came out loud and clear. And, um, I, yeah, and in the package from, t as I said already, you'll get a link to that so we can continue to get feedback from the community around what they think about that. So yeah, I, th I thought it was really great, a great first stop. Yeah. One more thing. So we've been pretty intentional at keeping the original proposal static as we've allowed the community and the staff and others to start to weigh in. Though we have received some incredibly rich feedback that has really influenced our thinking. So we are going to become prepared to start to roll out iterations of the original proposal. Um, we're just trying to manage that so that people aren't constantly trying to weigh in on a moving target. Right. So we're trying to have these moments. So um, the conclusion of tonight and that 60 people's comments and the hundreds of emails that I've received and um, some really good feedback coming in through Facebook and social media, I think gives us a reason to now say, okay, here's some evidence that we've been listening. <laughs> what do you think about this proposal? Um, and it's been fascinating to just see I mean, all through, Beth mentioned it, all through the educational leadership team, collaborative planning has been on the top in today's conversation with 60 or so people. It's, um, it's a two, two to one because coming same. across mm -hmm. as seeing the value there. Yeah. Um, so how do we do it with minimizing the impact is, is that. And I've been trying to explain how we can't chase down a solution to every possibility. We need this narrowing process we need to get as big as we possibly can and then begin a narrowing process so that we can focus our attention on the solutions we need to generate yeah and i think part of this approach is about what beth and brian do so well with this relationship building and the trust that needs to happen as a result of this and and when we can answer the why the how becomes like a puzzle to answer and is not so much like what are they doing to us and we're finding that already that the more opportunities that we have to engage people and talk to them, the more there's a, a breakdown of that us and them and more of how do we do this as a new district. And I think that's really important for these engagement efforts. I thought they were um, I, I, I have one question that came up uh, from somebody that spoke. Um, I think I envision that we've handled the financial piece of doing this in this year's budget. <coughs> Otherwise, I suspect you and Beth wouldn't be <coughs> bringing this forward to us. I think <coughs> for people that are concerned about that, that's one of the things I would address also, is that this was planned in the contract. I mean, there are some people that don't have kids in the school, and even some that do, that might think that we're jacking their budget or we're going to have a shortfall. Mm. Uh, so I, I heard that person. I think we should yeah. make sure we're clear about that also. I think there's a there's a two side there. Is we didn't we didn't build the budget preconceiving a, a final result. Yeah. Because right. that would be disingenuous to the whole process of receiving feedback. Right. I mean, there is some flexibility in there, but certainly depending upon what we choose, the priorities, the <laughs> compromises we make, the staging we want to go into, 
we'll need to take budget resources and use them differently than perhaps we originally planned. And that's the part, I mean, that's really where we'll be within that $76 <coughs> million, we're gonna have to say, well, not that, but this, and the 76 million doesn't change. Right. So that's the, that's the element that we'll have to do. But we're actually, you know, that's one thing that I've said is where change is really hard and it's hard to sort of anticipate it and wonder about it, but we're masters at dealing with it. I mean, every day in school is different. There's a change. Um, <laughs> And it's just like, you know, it's just like mastering. I mean, when I mastered raising my first child, I couldn't figure <laughs> out why the other two didn't behave exactly like the first one. Um, so we're, we, we are more accustomed to change than we sometimes give ourselves credit to, but I do appreciate people want to have answers as soon as they possibly can. And that's, that's our charge. Give it yeah. enough time, but get the answers as fast as possible. And that's what produces the anxiety. There were two things I you said tonight that I thought were important. One was two. nobody <laughs> nobody's ever asked us if we like the schedule that's in place. Yeah. Um, and I think that you know we don't. We just accept what is here. But it's when you try to change it that things fall apart. And I think the other the important thing you said was no matter where we end up, not everyone is going to be happy. That's just not possible. So I think those were two important points. Um, but I thought the discussion was great. And as usual, Liz and others did a great job designing the engagement um, so that people didn't feel defensive and they felt that their input was going to be honored. So it's important. I think that our communities overwhelmingly voted for us to merge the three communities. And, you know, we're fulfilling the promise of merger. We're trying to come up with what the Red Study Group saw that could happen and what we could become. And so I'm just really thankful that everybody's got a different way of coming about looking at things. So I'm very grateful for Beth and Brian and um, the way you're going forward with things. I appreciate it. I don't always say I appreciate you, but I do. <laughs> Okay, I have oh, one more, and then I'd like to move on. Yeah, so I just wanted to say two things. Um, I walked into the room tonight, and I'm generally not a cynic, <laughs> but the last memory I had of a public forum in that space was Schedule 2.0. Um, calendar. Calendar 2.0. <laughs> yes. So um, what I witnessed was a group of people that, some people at least at the table I was sitting at, they, they came loaded for bear. And what I thought was really ingenious in how you approached it is that they almost immediately became disarmed and, let, and realized that this wasn't gonna be a fight <laughs> and something wasn't gonna be imposed on them. And it was, it turned into like almost a, a friend, it was a friendly chat. The yeah. <laughs> so people talking, you know, even the most critical person at our table was offering, oh, well, you know, this is really, this is actually a benefit we should add. So it was really great. I really commend the way that you handled the, the, um, the, the event, and I encourage, um, I, I look forward to the next few. The other thing I wanted to say, though, is that as we want to be respectful and understand the many, many challenges and complaints that people will have, I would just encourage you all to, to keep in mind why you're trying to make this change happen and to not let that get watered down. Yeah. So while I think it's really important to take into consideration the actual pain and suffering that it may cause for some people, if you water it down to the point where it doesn't have the impact that you want it to have, then what was it all for? So, uh, but anyway, great, great first effort tonight, and I look forward to the others. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. All right, let's move on to our policies for second reading. Um, so we looked at them at first reading last time. We asked for uh, some minor changes. Are there any comments you want to make, Diane, before we The changes requested are there. Um, 
I ask for your approval for okay. anybody have any questions or comments before we do a motion okay then I'll entertain a motion to approve policies a22 e32 a21 c25 and b22 at second reading I'll make such a motion thank you is there any discussion all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. So our next item is annual meeting planning. Um, Beth, do you want to start us off? Or what are you thinking? Uh, well, I certainly can. So Ben did print out the um, draft for you to see the, an the annual report. It looks a lot different than it has in the past. Um, we do know that other districts in the area are going to this format um, and we worked with Ben on and Brian's all along has been bringing a kind of different presentation um, about the budget. So we tried to capture that and capture the story behind our system, our new district um, that includes the budget within it. There is um, a place where people can pick up more information. It's in here that they can come to the office or call, it will be mailed to them. So the, the more detailed budget that some might want would be, is available to people. It will read more like a magazine of facts and sharing the great celebrations and things that we're doing across the district. Um, and this, what's happening in the district is what the taxpayers money is going for so that's um the stories that we wanted to tell it is it is different Haley. Haley. it looks visually exciting but i'm concerned that some of the information is not going to be legible to people who don't have the advantage of like a magnifying glass ah <laughs> like the enrollment data, yeah. I can just about make out that I'm wearing very strong glasses. <laughs> um, so has if we want that information to, to be of use, um, for no, show. it has not. This is a draft. That, um, and like just the board report, that's it's hard to a little bit. Looking at the one that you have, I have a draft draft. Frightening. What's frightening, Kelly? The board report. Oh. <laughs> like, do I have three hours to read this page, oh. <laughs> or will I give up and move on to the next page? I didn't see that line when they wrote it. Well, I feel like that about this, too. Yeah, mine looks long, also. I fit mine on one page. <laughs> That's what it ends up when it's this. Yeah. Um, I think we ha are saying a reasonable amount of stuff, but that yeah. the effort to fit it onto one page makes it look scarier than it is because of the small font size. Yeah, I worry <clears throat> about people being able to read it, um, and I wonder if we could design it in such a way so that Beth's message takes up two pages and the board message takes up two pages, just so that we can make the font type larger. Yeah. And if you did that, that would probably help with the enrollment okay. piece as well. Yeah, right. No, it's not. But I'm wondering if it wouldn't be more appropriate for it to go in so other places says. where charts are. Like, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, that's pretty. No okay. Oh. Well. Uh, just a comment. Uh, if you talk to members of the public, mm -hmm. they are looking long. for what does that mean to me? What is this an increase or a decrease? Because it was a decrease last year. Um, having the percentage of increase or decrease along with what does that mean for changes in my tax bill? Um, and I know it's difficult this year for the way this state is structuring it. Yeah. Um, it's important. Possible and relevant to what people are looking for. And this is only the third year I've made this suggestion. So it's, on one hand, I'm a little concerned that we can't get a basic piece of information in that is uh, really wanted by 
the taxpayers well, of our community. The, the challenge is um, that um, I know. we don't know what the tax impact is. And I think this year, more than ever, we don't know because the, the early projected rates, yields that were put out, were based on budget assumptions that didn't happen. Well, then give them a range. Well, that is in the information that they can link to. There's a lot of information here. I don't, I don't, well, okay. Thank we you. have to keep remembering that folks are voting on the budget. Yeah. Um, I did notice that this um, draft has a meeting warning that doesn't include your signature and Brendan's signature. Did you both go in and sign? Okay, so Ben will have that. This was done before you had signed. Yeah. So, okay. Um, other comments, Kim? I was just going to echo and in, in response to Al, too, is that it's so very dynamic this year. It's not just recalculating the yield. It could be that we end up with something entirely different. I would hope that by the time we get to presenting this at our annual meeting that we might be in a position to offer some information if it to maybe we'd at least have a new yield that is closer to reflecting the budgets that had been passed, but we I don't know. We could end up in the end of June before they decide if they're going to change the funding formula. So this year, more than ever, it's hard to do that with any integrity. And I'd be fearful that we would print something that wouldn't. We couldn't even guess if they didn't change the funding formula what the right yield is right now. I don't think. Um, so I guess I would just say I'm imagining that we will be able to incorporate whatever information we have when we get to that budget meeting if we have something that we feel has any credibility um, right I would think and I, I think Sorry. otherwise printing and if there are things that allow us to link as information comes in there's that budget tab on our website right on the home page and that will be populated as we have accurate information I'm sure I do I don't know I guess I'm Rethinking it a little bit in terms of whether we shouldn't have something somewhere that is that um, page that we had in the presentation um, with all the caveats on it. I think, I mean, I know when I've looked at other districts, they've included that. and. So I, I'm going to agree with Al that, that probably we better have a page that does that with all the caveats on it. Yeah, there, I mean, some of that is, is really, I, I need to take the bullet for that for, and not Ben, is that he's been very patient in having me circle back to budget work as we've been working through a few other um, community engagements and other work. So um, I think you know, more breathing space, larger font, having something for the tax range. Um, all of these are great suggestions. Making sure the warning that's published is the one that has all the signatures. I, I think that anything, that's the exact purpose of what this evening is um, and can give us some good process to focus our attention. It's, uh, Ben's trying to get it to the printer next week. Okay, good. So we have time. So if you, I would say if you think of other Feedback, let me know, and um, and I'll pass it along. So I, let's talk about the meeting itself. Oh, I, I just want to say I, I like how you approach this. I think it stands out a little more than the typical traditional, so I don't want to just be negative Nelly here. <laughs> I, I do like the approach and the new way and I love the fact that you put Nick's picture. I know I love that too. Again. It's such a smile. Um, yeah. Martha can I yeah. just ask do you anticipate that they would provide any updated yield based on the budgets that currently passed or they won't do that while they're considering? 
there yeah, is something up there, but it um, it doesn't include Burlington's budget and our budget. Um, so I would li I can check to see whether they have the have we submitted our budget. We have. I've submitted it to um, Brad. Brad. And yeah. So there's still some more formalities, but honestly, where I've been following the bouncing ball is that they were working and putting all their efforts into a recalculated yield, and then we came up with a new pre-K funding formula, a new special ed funding formula, and a new education funding formula, and they are just waiting to see what goes through crossover. And I mean, they're they're working numbers. The whole state right now is working numbers in a real time basis to try to because. Yeah. There's a forty million dollar amount that the governor still wants to, s in order Cut. to sign, yeah. and and that is taking out of ninety five percent of the school budgets that have already passed. Right. Yeah. So the answer is we no. don't have a clue, and we're not going to have a clue on uh, April 9th. But I think we I think republishing what is been in all our board documents and on our website is a very reasonable thing. And that's really what was done for all the budgets that were voted on in March. Yeah. Those were the numbers that were used. So I think that's the safest thing to do. Um, I do have a couple of questions about the annual meeting itself. Um, do we know if the present moderator, clerk, and treasurer are willing to be nominated again? Has anybody checked in with them? John Sonic is. John is, right. So who should be checking in with Susan and who's the treasurer? Our business person. Is she both the clerk and the treasurer? I should I know that. Right in there. Oh, John is the clerk and yeah. the moderator, and Sue is the treasurer. Right. Okay. All right. So, um, Kim, can I ask you to contact John and just make sure that he still will be willing to be? the moderator and clerk, and I'll contact Susan and make sure she's still willing to be the treasurer. Good. Okay. Is there anything else on that warning that we need to prepare for in any particular way? I don't think so. Most of it, a lot of it gets voted on the next day. And Brian, you intend to do the budget presentation. Okay, great. Any other questions or comments? So, um, auditorium, right. big long table in the front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look a lot like it always looks. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Place for you. Laser John to stand behind. <laughs> Pyrotechnic. <laughs> Yeah. to be let off with your bubble. I was excited last year. Bubbles. We had more people turn out than I ever saw at Essex Junction <laughs> District separately for our budget annual meetings. So it's pretty well. small for Westford. <laughs> oh, depends. Okay, let's move on to task team updates. Um, Liz and Patrick. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work with voices, uh, obviously. <laughs> um, we were working on the forum for tonight, on the on the conversation tonight. We're also Voices for Education is working um, uh, with the administration on uh, the safety forum that's get scheduled for April second. The working title of of that is the, is safety, belonging, and voice working together for a safer community. That's going to be held on April 2nd from 6.30 to 8 at the EHS cafeteria. And, um, and so Voices and has been working on that and the communications team on getting the word out about that. Um, uh, the other follow-up from the resolution that we sent to all, all the legislators, um, I have received uh, feedback from uh, Rebecca Holcomb from Dylan Giambista, Tim Ash, Debbie Ingram, and Betsy Dunn, 
all of who thanked us for doing that and taking a leadership role um, in the state with that strong resolution and, and all, of, all of those, all the names I just mentioned had that same sentiment. Uh, Pat, did you have? Um, no, I don't know if you wanted to report on the trip to Rhode Island. Oh. Sure. Um, yeah, I pretty. forgot about that. Uh, we also went to Rhode Island. Um, Beth and uh, Sue McCormick and Jamal and Tess and I presented at the New England Secondary School Consortium uh, School Redesign and Action Conference that took place in Providence last week. Um, we were scheduled to give two presentations. I had to take the students home because of the snowstorm that was pending, so we ended up having to miss the second day of presentations. Um, but we were able to talk about and uh, the work that Voices has done in the district and how that has helped the administration and the community to feel connected. And we modeled some of the work that we did in our community conversations to, um, to really model what, what engagement can look like and feel like if it's done well. And it, 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 it uh, generated some really interesting conversations around that. Um, and I will just say while I'm on Voices in general, we're really excited, the group is really excited about these opportunities that are starting to happen where there's a real role to help the administration and the community have these hard conversations. And if you remember two years ago, two and a half years ago when we were thinking about that grant, that was a real priority for us to really figure out how to do this better. And while we certainly have a long way to go, all those people showing up tonight and the efforts to communicate I think are really showing with people coming to the meetings and with the great work that Ben and the administration is doing and Pat with his Facebook moderation and the, the whole <laughs> team I think we're starting to see that change and, and hopefully will lead to a, a different culture that we set out to create when we got this grant so thanks to everybody. Thanks. Brendan. Um, I wonder if there's been any feedback um, regarding the communication around the budget. I, I have not heard a lot of personal yeah. comments yet. There's some comments on front page four tonight. Yeah, Ben actually sent something to all of us <coughs> uh, just before the meeting started. Okay. Um, rural Essex um, had some questions about the budget actually centered around specifically what the real tax impact was going to be. So I think it's probably a good thing that we're, we actually addressed it completely independently, but someone may want to reach out to that specific individual, but they did have question, one question at least about that that came up. Um, otherwise, I haven't received anything and I haven't heard anything from people in the community posting anything that I've seen or sending emails that I'm aware of. But I suspect Brian probably gets more of those sorts of questions yeah I've, I've had a few community members that have contacted me I've sat down with a couple of the people that are a little bit more you know the usual kind of want to see the numbers and stuff um, I think people are have been uh, have respected the fact that we're lowering our educational spending for people that we're nowhere near where the governor was talking that they appreciate the presentation where it was quick to be able to see our ratios are above where um, that is, that we're seeing our spending in line, if not better than has been expected, and that the promise for merger, people have appreciated that it seems like we're delivering, especially by lessening the size of our administration. So that's the feedback that I've gotten so far. I, I think, you know, I don't <coughs> think that it's always a done deal, but coming off of a town meeting where there was such a number of positive votes uh, that that also is a sign that we're not seeing that sort of manufactured or materializing revolt mm -hmm. against. In Essex or statewide? Statewide, yeah. Uh, it was 95% of school budgets that passed and those ones that didn't do have a track record of having some difficulty mm -hmm. on first votes. So. Um, I think that that's part of the problem right now in Montpelier is people feel pretty satisfied with the work of their school board and of the budget creation, but overall it's not matching some people's expectations of what we want to be doing. Thanks. Okay, anything else on communications? All right, um, superintendent, staff update? I do not have any. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. um, I think we should take this local board piece off now because the local boards are officially non-existent now. Um, statewide updates. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Um, there is a bill on the floor today. Who knows, they may still be there debating it. Um, that would change the way education is funded um, and would add an income tax surcharge to add to the education fund. Um, it's not clear what's going to happen with that. Um, Kim and I have been communicating particularly with Dylan, um, and sometimes that's copied to our other reps. Um, mostly our concerns about that proposal. Um, the miscellaneous Ed bill is up in the Senate, and there is one good piece of news there in that they have added the correct language to do what we had tried to get done last year, so that the election of school board members would be part of our warning and not an individual town warning. So, um, and hopefully it's drafted correctly this time. So um, that will have to pass the Senate and go to the House. So hopefully it'll make it through the whole process. Um, the special ed bill is up, I think, as well. We have uh -huh. Dylan testify today, and Erin will testify in front of the Senate when it so gets to that point. Yeah. She's the closer for us. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess I can't remember. Has it passed the House, or is it up in the House I right think it's now? in the House right now. Yeah, I yeah. think it's up for debate, yeah. as well as the budget is. So yeah, they have a very busy week ahead of them. Kim, do you have anything to add? Um, the pre-K bill. Um, I we've I don't know what ended up happening. They were concerned that they would be closing hearing anything without hearing the. There's an a part of it that is looking to remove the ability to count pre-K as our ADM, and that is pretty impactful, and it would. Some of what I think might also happen is it removes it so far from the schools that some of the continuity that we've developed over the relationships that have been built with the preschools that we work with currently, it seems as though that could find its way entirely outside of the system. And even to the extent pre-K is within our building, should it not be beyond, I think, it's, I think you need something like 20 hours or something to count it to be able to count them as fractional, 0.46. Um, the concern more recently was that they were going to move that out of committee without hearing from um, interested parties, like schools. So um, quickly, those of us on the VSBA board sent out um, some messages and heard back from those legislators. Thank you for getting in touch, um, just to make sure they would be taking testimony. Um, I don't know what ended up happening out of that, so I've not heard yeah. an update. I you, do you know, Martha? I no. don't. I, I was trying to keep track of a couple of other bills, yeah. and I no. haven't kept track of that one, but I'll, I'll check on it. Yeah, I so well. any questions or anything that folks want us to spend more time on? Yeah, Marla. Sorry, I read uh, that letter from VSBA and I didn't follow up to keep an eye on it because I'm so sure you always do. Uh -huh. What was that about the merger uh, tax? Yes, and that was, that was very confusing in that alert that came from VSBA. Their second point was that the, the um, Ed funding bill changed something about merger incentives. Well, it's nothing that applies to us. And I think that's all I'll say for right now, because <laughs> what it does apply to is a very complicated piece. Okay. 
but it didn't nice. affect our district. I was so afraid you were, you know, I'm not going to be there at an annual meeting, but I thought you were going to have to explain no. something to the no. public. No, um, that was for districts that had very disparate tax rates going into merger, and we didn't have that situation. So, so it doesn't affect us, which is what I think you need to hear. Okay, um, so our board agenda for April 3rd. Um, anybody have anything? I started reading that letter from the VSBA regarding, I think it was at VSBA, on the VHI uh, mm -hmm. issues, and, it, uh, and I wasn't quite clear what the impact was for our district. Uh, the second point I had was, will the early release proposal that we heard tonight, since it is an hour per for the number of sessions, will it affect our ADM numbers? No. Yeah, absolutely sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Liz? I uh, am remembering three voices that Rob said he would make a presentation to the boys in the spring about the grade changing. And I know we're in spring, so I don't know that it needs to be next week, but I just wanted to get that on your radar. I do have that written down for April, okay. and um, I know that it can't be the next meeting, but I'm hoping that it could be the following one. Great, thanks. Um, Patrick? I was wondering if, uh, could, because this is something that came up tonight as well, um, it, are we or can we get an update on where we stand about transportation for Essex Junction? Has there been any movement? Cause I, haven't, I don't think we've heard about that in a couple of months, and that's big on community members' minds. I was asked about that. Yeah. yeah. No, it clearly was at the table I was sitting at. Yeah. We're, we do know. Oh, go ahead, Brad. No, I was just going to say some of the alignment that we're looking for is to try to move it so that um, potentially as early as April 17th that we could have a feeling that we've got a schedule for school start and stop times that we can then really begin to work all the various solutions on, transportation becoming one of the larger ones, and so that we have a given and that um, we have already begun taking a look at uh, things such as leasing buses and so forth for self-performing special education so I can I can give some it could also just be in board notes but I, I think we're you know we've learned our lesson that we want to know these things really early but there's also sort of chapters and pages for us to go through and and some of it sort of lines up um, I mean my goal is that we would be at the end of the school year that people are concluding and they would have bus schedules, bus stops, bus times, and bus numbers at that point in time. That, that's the, that I think is, that's, your goal. that's the goal. And certainly that's, that's better than, we've, than any of the previous have been, except right. people have known history. But as we are looking at change, I think that that would be a, that would be a very respectful kind of lineup is that you would finish a school year and you would know what it's gonna look like going into the next year. Okay. And we are going to um, have Beth's goals um, are going to come. We've been a little slow <laughs> being able to get, <laughs> being able, yes. Things are happening. We just haven't put that specifically in front of the board. So that will happen at the April 3rd meeting. And just a reminder that there will be another community engagement opportunity at 5.30 that night again around stop and start times and um, early release. Okay. Um, Martha? Yes. Can you please give me what we are talking about at the agenda? Or what's the agenda? I want to know what we're putting on there. I'm, there's a lot of discussion and I don't know what was concrete. Oh. Okay, so what's definitely on the agenda is state updates, tax team updates. Oh, those things that all are normal. Have. Are you doing an update on transportation? 
I don't believe so. It sounds like if we get something, it's going to be in our board notes. Okay. Then what am I missing? Um, Superintendent's goals. Right. Okay. That'll be the presentation. Best Beehive issues. Yeah. Um, I think Brian can just put that in the notes. What's happening with that? Okay. Kim. Transportation, since the questions are coming at us live, the board notes don't end up having the same airing as an update provided here. And so I know that we often talk through those issues when we're preparing the agenda. So um, I think that, especially with its public attention. Let's, let's talk about that with, with Brian yeah. then. If we, we may decide to put it on the agenda, I don't think you need to put it in the minutes. Mom, okay. A future, for the future, because I'm going to be not here for a while. I'm just curious as we're talking about communications and we're talking about collaboration, is there any talk about the PTOs? You know how they're all separated. Is there any discussion that anybody knows about or that can be reported on? on uh, the PTOs at one of the future meetings? Um, I mean, I can speak a little bit to that. As the communications team, um, we are going to be looking at uh, reaching out to the PTOs um, just uh, as a, a method of facilitation for getting word out to parents. Um, a lot of them, you know, even with as often as we publish takeaways and put things in SXVT, I mean, quite frankly, uh, I mean, I think during the meeting we saw tonight, most people came here because they saw an email that they got from the district. It wasn't from any other source. Um, so I think Liz and I plan to, I don't know, probably sometime next month, um, talk about how we're going to reach out to the PTOs and get parents involved. And I've gone to PTO meetings at Hiawatha and tried to give a few, you know. But there's no could. conversation of them all becoming like an elementary they, PTO? They and then like met a, in the fall, and I think they've, they shared, and I think they want to keep sharing their good ideas, but I think they really want their focus mostly to be at the building level, although in Essex Town, it covers all three buildings, but in Essex Junction and Westford, it's a building-specific group. And they really, I think this is correct, Kim, I think they really want to keep the structures they've had um, and keep the focus they have, but be communicating with each other so they can share good ideas. Okay. And I think, that's, I think that's the right thing to do right now. I think actually it's probably also worthwhile for either, it, whether it happens through Liz and Patrick or you and I and Martha, just reaching out for a follow-up to see if over the course of the year they've had continuous conversation or how, or because I think just gone off and this, focused on what they had to accomplish. Yeah, yeah. just I, having a better sense of, I think everybody's noticed over this year the be relationships beginning across our buildings and mm -hmm. that may lend itself to something a little, a little different and it, or they may say no at least for another year we're keeping it the same and then we would I think have a better idea of how to be most effective with them maybe right. yeah I mean I will say that I'm sorry Liz you've been trying go to ahead, talk no, go ahead. Like, <laughs> um, I, I do think uh, part of the reason why we had such good turnout at our previous meeting was that I did go to each individual PTO and ask them to share the agenda for the start and start time. So I hit Essex, I hit Essex Town, I hit each individual Essex Junction School, and they all shared it on their individual pages. So it's not just in Essex VT, but I think that that further outreach does actually do a lot in getting people to our meetings. So I'm going to be parochial. This is the third time tonight that there's been discussion where Westford hasn't been included. No, I said Westford. I apologize. Mm -hmm. You didn't. But no. I don't think. But okay, I, Westford was included. Yes, That's yes, I, I, I did. I did Thank include you. Westford PTO. All right. Thanks. I just want to, um, while I, I well, I think the turnout was great tonight, and I think email is truly the best way to reach parents. 
Um, I'll just remind everyone that our audience is not just the school community, but the community at large. So we can't forget the importance of social media, the Essex Reporter, and um, the Westford Newsletter yeah. <laughs> and Front Porch Forum. So. Yeah. Yeah. I know you haven't. I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of that. OK. Um, takeaways from tonight's meeting. Um, I think the um, structured collaborative time, yeah. definitely. Um, I think the the vision, and um, and I would put in something about the school start and end times and the conversations that are taking place prior to um, the meetings. And, and I think from now until the budget vote, you just a line or two about the annual meeting and when the budget vote is taking place as something that needs to go in there. Anybody have anything else? Kim? Not particularly, but I'm realizing that I was looking at my notes and what Kim had asked and Liz had mentioned the EHS grading, which isn't for the next meeting, but for future agenda items, that probably should be captured as well, That because it'll be an update later. Well, it could, yeah. Mm -hmm. We could do it at the next meeting yeah. for that agenda, too. All right, anything else? Good meeting, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pardon? Can you suggest anything to be put on the agenda at this point? Uh, oh, I've never had a community member suggest something from the agenda, but what are you thinking about? I would like to investigate a policy that tries to keep our schools as apolitical as possible. Um, again, I'm going to go off of what I was talking before. I, I don't think it's right that political groups be afforded any kind of classroom time to uh, address our students or any facilities. Like the gym, I, it seems to me that the gym was kind of cordoned off for this service that they had and that we had political uh, representatives come in. Well, what happened to the gym class that should have been using that gym? Okay, I don't they think, the gym. They were I, I don't think we should be using any, keep away from using facilities to accommodate any, any political activities. I, I, I just really want the schools to be apolitical. I think the challenger is going to be that your definition of political and my definition of political may be different. And as Liz pointed out earlier, students do have free speech rights. And free speech, but the faculty doesn't need to accommodate that. You did, no one had to schedule okay. the gym time for the state representative. It was not. It wasn't, OK, then I misunderstood what the principal yeah, was saying about that. Uh, it was outside on the, on the um, football but I do field. know Kevin Briggs allowed the class homerooms to be addressed by these students. So I do know the classroom time was given. I, I guess I would just say it was students addressing them. The politicians weren't but coming doesn't to Doesn't matter. They're, they're representing a political agenda, and it's a captive audience. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not apolitical, is my point. And again, I think we're going to disagree about that. OK, then again, if, the, if it's not apolitical, then I can bring in students for I can indoctrinate them, send them in for whatever I want. And they should be afforded the same amount of time. But do you want to respond to that? There, there are specific, <clears throat> there are specific limits to what can and can't happen. There are, and this um, one I think affected students the most because it happened to students their age and at a school. And I think that that's what really, um, as our student read and how much fear it, it um, imposed on them. And that, that's where it started from. I, and I some disagree. of the other political issues are not to come here. It, it doesn't affect the school system. There are, there's a lot about freedom of speech and um, if it really is disruptive to learning and all of that. This was a learning opportunity for students um, in, in fear. We have to address fears and allow them to, to speak to those and support their fears. 
or to support. Yeah, mentioning their fears and right. making it a comfortable place to come to school. If we if we did not follow through on some of that, I think we would have had some outbursts, and I don't think that would have been appropriate. I, I'm curious if the policy committee could look at um, some of the policies. I know at CCSU level, we and I think Westford, we had a very strict policy about how far away from the school's political signs for candidates running because and so I think that whole general conversation does need to happen I think we need updates where we stand because I thought I heard at one of the schools policy one of the on um, yeah. town of Essex schools uh, someone was telling me that their signs were I think posted on a school uh, where I think at the high school we always said they had to hold their signs that's a, and that's their an election political buttons can't come into law. the voting that's an election law and the signs are on Founders Road or, or for that last election they people post them down Founders Road I think people who own some of those properties have not been happy about that in the past that happens not to be something we have control over but but we do have on the books an approved community use of school facilities so I think that and and the fact that there's student rights, freedom of expression, that is another guidepost. So, um, yeah, so I think those are two things you can look at, Earl, is what our facilities use policy is and what the ACLU website says. Well, about you can't suppress the, it doesn't matter how many there are, majority, minority. They have the, the minority students, 3%, have the same, right, same, same yes, amount of right to speak as the majority. So and to say that it's only for the majority of this particular issue, that's not, it doesn't keep the other people from speak, having the right to speak as well. Correct. That's correct. As long as it's not disruptive to student learning and it is not, I can't think of the right words, but if it was a white supremacist group that was going to cause students to be fearful, then you can limit that kind of speech. OK. Well, I still think a future agenda of having these policies brought to the board and getting updates where the whole board hears it all together, I think, would be valuable. Well, some of it's policy and some of it's just procedure. So, um, but the policy committee can think about that. I, I think it'd be worthwhile. Okay. All right. Anything else? Okay. Thank you again. We are adjourned.